Uh, I'm supposed to be here talking about modern advocacy, but let me instead talk about ancient advocacy, uh, not Cicero. Uh, this is about the 1980s when I started in practice. Uh, written outlines were rare, uh, even in appeals. Uh, the few that appeared were short. Uh, I have an outline uh, when I was junior in the late 1980s to Ms Kiefel of Queen's Council. It was an appeal in the full federal court. It was two and a half pages long. Uh, unreported cases were rarely cited, uh, doing so suggested a weak case. Although the photocopier had been invented many, many decades uh, before, bound volumes of the reports were taken to court. The Supreme Court Library provided uh, orange uh, bookmarks, this is before the invention of the post-it sticker, and barristers uh, would hand up cases to the judge to read and the judge would be taken through the case. Since then, uh, written submissions have generally improved in quality uh, and they certainly uh, imp improved or increased in quantity. They're no longer voluntarily, voluntary, uh, they're mandatory uh, in many courts. There are page limits and there are templates that you have to follow in some courts practice directions. In any court, however high, however low, uh, written submissions are the raw material for an extempore or reserved judgment. The increased importance of written advocacy in all courts may suggest to some that there's a decreased role for oral advocacy. I would completely disagree. Oral advocacy is as important as ever. The compression of time for oral advocacy makes it all the more important for it to be effective. Written and oral submissions have to cover the same basic territory. You can't depart from something that's in a written submission that's been filed unless something uh, new comes up. But that doesn't mean that oral advocacy simply consists of, as it were, speaking to written submissions that you hope the judge has read. Oral submissions need to be fresh. So there are different skills required for written and oral advocacy, but good advocacy in both its forms has certain features. Now, these are the points that I'm going to run over tonight. I won't read them to you. You see them there. Uh, and we'll progress through them. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And I'm not talking about when some of us were uh, young in the 1980s, at the height of the Bjorki Peterson era. I'm talking about the opening words from Charles Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities. Now, most people who have read the book or even people who have heard about it know about the opening lines, but very few people would remember the last words in that novel. So, the advocate's opening words are important. They should distill the essence uh, of the case. Uh, they <coughs> should be simple, but they shouldn't be inaccurate. They shouldn't be overblown. They should not be boring. Uh, in my experience, and the experience of many judges, um, after a written submission's gone in or a written submission's handed up and the judge reads it, uh, the advocate starts something uh, like this. Uh, if you're on, I'll turn to uh, Exhibit SKA on blah, 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 blah. Well, that's, that's terrific, but perhaps not so terrific. Two problems. The judge, if that clause is important, the judge will have already read it in the written submissions or a distillation of it. So you don't need to go to that first. You might come back to it, but you don't, need, you don't need to go to that first. Why wouldn't you keep it short and simple? Why wouldn't you simply say, the defendant promised to deliver 275 tungsten widgets to the plaintiff by April 17? That's what clause 17.4G says. Keep it simple. The defendant failed to deliver on time. Widgets were delivered on August 3, but they were gravely defective. The plaintiff could not use the widget to commission its new facility. The defendant's breaches caused the plaintiff great losses, quantified at $2.17 billion. Simple. States the case simply. What it doesn't state uh, is the defence. And so in that opening burst, <laughs> you might say, the only real defence uh, is that the written promise to deliver on April 17 was varied. But that defence is feeble. The contemporary documents show the parties always proceeded on the basis of an April 17 delivery date. Then here's the big part. You state the issue. 
Can the defendant prove, contrary to the contemporaneous documents, that there was a binding oral agreement to vary the delivery date? So in the space of uh, about uh, 56 words, I think it is, you've summed up the case and you framed the issue. Uh, in the paper, which is uh, longer than I can talk uh, for tonight, uh, I've uh, dealt with a similar uh, issue uh, in the criminal law, uh, and that is what happens when, say, there's a bail application. And both in written submissions and in oral submissions, uh, you'll uh, hear something like, uh, uh, the applicant is alleged to have trafficked in methamphetamine by supplying drugs to a small group of associates in small amounts over the period between 1 April 2016 and 28 April 2016. Police executed a search warrant on the 27th of July 2016 at the plaintiff's home and seized a mobile phone, blah, 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 blah. Then we get the, then we get the uh, criminal history of the applicant. On it goes, on it goes, on it goes, on it goes. Well, why wouldn't your written submissions and your similar oral submissions start something like this. The alleged offence is serious. Someone can take the stopwatch out and see how long this takes. The alleged offence is serious, but the Crown case has its problems. The applicant has passed convictions for drugs, but those relatively minor offences were committed when he was an addict. He's now drug free and has a place in a residential rehabilitation facility. He has a prima facie entitlement to bail. Unless granted bail, there's a real risk that the applicant will spend longer in custody waiting trial than the non-parole period of any sentence. Plus, there's a real prospect that he'll be acquitted of the charge. The risk of re-offending is reduced to an acceptable level by strict residential reporting and drug testing conditions. Now, how long did that take? Um, and the facts, of course, the trafficking allegations, what had happened, the mobile phones and the like, would need to be addressed. Of course they would. Later in the submissions. Uh, and you should preview the problems of the Crown case. You say, uh, even if the Crown can prove that the text messages record supplies by the applicant rather than his former girlfriend who used the phone, the alleged supplies are few and fall far short of proving that he carried on business of selling drugs. At best for the Crown, he was an occasional street level supplier. So you're distilling why you say, in the second sense, that the Crown case for trafficking has its problems. Well, that brings me to the topic of issue framing. And you have there uh, the propositions and the doyen of this area. And in my paper, you'll hear his name a lot. You'll hear his name a lot tonight. Professor Brian Garner, distinguished American academic says that any piece of persuasive analytical writing has to deliver three things, the question, the answer, and the reasons for the answer. And he says you have to open with a factually specific issue that captures the essence of the problem, and that's what we call issue framing. So that introduction concisely states the exact point at issue stripped of all extraneous matter. Uh, Garner says that that doesn't happen, that most lawyers, including ones in the, America, in the United States, we write all in the middle. It's not the introduction and conclusion, it's we all just write in the middle and I'm guilty of that uh, just about every day. He says you should be able, a reader should be able to, within 60 seconds of picking up a document, uh, work out what it's about because it should open with a factually specific issue that captures the essence of the problem. So um, here's some tips, uh, you'll get the PowerPoint and, or you'll get my paper. You put the issues first. You don't open up with a long line. The issue in this appeal is whether blah, 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 which is loading both law and facts into it. Separate sentences. Try and bring the whole thing in, in a couple of sentences in under 75 words. Arrange the facts, naturally, chronologically. And this is his great theory. You pose the question at the end, and you don't need to worry about whether answer is yes or no, if you framed it sensibly and cleverly, uh, it will answer itself in a piece of persuasive uh, issue framing. So statement, statement, question is the basic uh, philosophy. So issue framing is more than just stating a mere conclusion. Because as great people uh, like Carl Llewellyn um, said, uh, if, you, if the judge accepts the way you have framed the issue, you'll probably win the case. 
the great uh, Judge Felix uh, Frankfurter uh, said the right answer depends on putting the right question. Now, uh, I want to uh, move on to this topic, which is central to Garner's uh, theology, I'll call it that. That's the difference between surface issues and deep issues. Uh, in the sort of area that I used to practice in, uh, I would, before I got the Garner Kool-Aid and drank it, uh, I would start uh, a set of written submissions by, by saying something like, uh, the uh, issue uh, in this case is whether the applicant is entitled to compensation from the respondent for a contravention of, in those old days, it used to be Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act. So you'd state that issue. Well, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I've put there on the PowerPoint a similar surface issue. Well, it's clear, it's simple, but the problem uh, with it uh, is uh, that it's not very helpful to the reader to understand something in a specific context. And so on the bottom of the page, I've got the same case framed by the respondent. Uh, and for those who can't see the PowerPoint uh, as I'm talking, it says, the respondent told the applicant about the trading history of his shop. He said nothing about future earnings. What he said about the trading history was indisputably correct. The applicant made assumptions about the shop's turnover under his new management. These turned out to be too optimistic. Can the respondent be said to have engaged in misleading or deceptive conduct when everything he said was true? The question suggests the answer. Uh, and that distinguishes persuasive issue framing from analytic uh, issue framing, which I deal with in uh, the paper. This is uh, about uh, advocacy. Uh, analytic uh, issue framing is the type of thing you do in an opinion or, uh, and advice. It has the same uh, tools, the basic rules. It's framed uh, in a simple way. Uh, so that you get the question within you know, the first 75 words or the like. But the question there doesn't suggest the answer. If you're doing that opinion, you might say, um, for the reasons that follow, I consider the answer is yes. And then explain the pros and cons uh, and the arguments for and against, canvas the evidence. That's, that's analytical uh, issue framing. Uh, I'm talking tonight about persuasive issue framing. Now, why don't we all uh, issue frame from birth? Um, well, I think there's two reasons for it. Uh, and one is that we tend to do one um, or the other thing. Uh, one is that we over particularise. That is, uh, we make the reader find the issue at about page nine. We start once upon a time, this happened, this happened, that happened, then this happened, and blah, 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 and proceed, blah, blah, blah. And eventually, uh, after sort of in the process of writing, we figured out what the issue is. The issue bubbles to the surface at about page, page nine uh, of the uh, submissions. And the other is the thing that I've dealt with, uh, framing uh, it in far too an abstract or general way. That's uh, surface issues. Well, you can find out more about this. I'm not on the commission uh, for the winning brief. Uh, my copy is in the hands of my associate who takes it home every night and reads it. Um, and Garner writes a, a monthly column in the uh, American Bar Association Journal about these technical things of how we write. So. Um, just in terms of some techniques, um, avoid the one long sentence. I've already dealt, dealt with this. Uh, it's just too hard to grasp. Uh, include enough detail to tell a story. Well, that's uh, obvious. Who did what? What happened? Don't include unnecessary detail. You don't need to include dates, times, clause numbers, uh, specific locations in that part. You might need to put those details in later, but don't strip out all unnecessary detail in that first page. You've got to sound objective, of course. Uh, it goes without saying. Uh, everything you say 
in court and in a court document has to be honestly stated. There's no point in distortion or misstatement, apart from being unethical and unprofessional, it's counterproductive, since your opponent or the judge will point out the error and blow your case. So there's no point in putting contentious, controversial things that you can't prove. Try and stick to the facts, the uncontroverted facts. Uh, save the argument for later. Uh, and as Garner says, you end every issue with a question mark. There might, need, there might be five cases, five issues, terms of the contract, breach, whatever. So you might need to do an issue frame for each uh, issue in the case. And of course, there's the point of counter-framing. Uh, if you're a respondent, you don't need to weigh, accept the way that the applicant has framed the case. In fact, you'd be probably foolish to do that. So there's more than one way to frame a case for the court's determination, and you shouldn't let your opponent get away with framing it in a way that helps them and hurts you. So if you're a respondent, you're trying to reframe uh, the issue. And there's just a simple example um, from Ghana of uh, an example of issue framing. You see the point? Fact specific. First sentence states the law. Fact, fact, fact. Answer, obvious. If only it was so simple. Um, but that's what you're aiming for. Statement of a rule, if you've got to say the you know, clause, you know, section so-and-so, the state act, whatever it is, prohibits this. Sim simple statement of the law, free of too much uh, detail. Fact, 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 question. Well, uh, I alluded to this before. Why do we over-particularise um, and bury the issue? Uh, I think it has a lot to do with the writing process where time poor, uh, and some of us think, well, perhaps because we're time poor, we just have, have to get started, and we just get started uh, without much planning, and away we go, and that's how the issue bubbles uh, to the surface. Uh, and many people, Mark Twain falsely accused of having uh, said this, but it goes back to uh, Blaise Pascal in 1657, basically, if I had more time, uh, I would have written you a shorter letter. Uh, and that's the challenge for us uh, all, uh, that it's uh, easier to get there on the typewriter, get there on the dictaphone, and blast the stuff onto the page. Um, and if you had more time, you would cull and reduce it down and rework it, but we don't have that time. So uh, we are writers. We are legal writers. We are writers of legal prose. Uh, and a big error is to think that there's two stages of writing. I'll just write this thing and then I'll come back and edit it. Well, people at university would have told you this, I guess, uh, when you're planning uh, an answer in an exam or anything, there's different stages of writing. And there's the madman who just, uh, you need to get uh, everything down on the page, all your thoughts after you've read the stuff and read the cases, no particular order, but you're uh, putting down your different thoughts. <laughs> Then there's the uh, architect. Uh, you're thinking about now, where do the facts fit in here? Do I put all the facts right up the front or do I do a bit of facts under each, each issue? How do I organise the facts, only the relevant facts? What headings am I going to use? Uh, what's the sequence here? Uh, how do I reach a conclusion? And when you're doing that architectural thing, it's the notes to the carpenter that just do a little note about the citation of the case or where you're going to, what paragraph of the affidavit you're going to pick up. So these are just little notes that you're doing to yourself when you put on the carpenter hat. And the carpenter then uh, has to work off what should be detailed architect's plans, not just some thought bubble. The final uh, part of being a writer, uh, which the literary people say is the judge. Now, I'm not talking about judge like me. They're talking about uh, the person who scrutinises something carefully, fixes up the punctuation, that word would be better, uh, fine attention to details. That's the final thing. Uh, that's not me uh, judging my own work. That's Philip Roth at his stand-up desk, uh, probably reading one of his own works. So that's that fourth stage. But we tend to compress all these things uh, into one. Uh, now, I haven't got the time tonight, but these are readily accessible. Uh, you'd have to get the book to 
get them all, but you can actually get online. Garner's book, The Winning Brief, has 100 tips for writing. Uh, and they're just uh, a few uh, of them. Of course, uh, they seem so obvious when you see them, but we don't often apply them. Uh, one thing that I would add to that, uh, which is my addition, don't use a long word if a short word will do. A lot of people, including high school students, university students, think I'm going to impress the teacher, the lecturer, by using big words. All the studies show that people get better marks from examiners by using short words and short sentences. They seem more clever than people who write long convoluted sentences with convoluted words. <coughs> so, uh, I won't stick around to read these things to you. You can read them or you can read my paper. Uh, Garner is not the originator of all these thoughts. For example, uh, one of those points that I've got there, uh, end each sentence with a punch, that comes from Carl Llewellyn, uh, who said that uh, in a sentence, the punch word or the punch phrase comes last. So you should always pay close attention uh, to phrasing and place strong words in emphatic positions. Now, um, the great American jurist, uh, Louis Brandeis, said there's no such thing as good legal writing, only rewriting. Uh, sad but true, uh, but there's an important point here. The time that we spend on rewriting uh, is reduced if we plan to write before we write. If the architect does the job, there'll be less time spent rewriting. If I don't plan a judgment well enough, I spend enormous time rewriting, better to plan. Just like you told the university, you, know, you might have five minutes for perusal, take 10 minutes. When everyone else picks up the pen, you keep planning. Planning is important. But rewriting is equally important. Uh, that little uh, piece of scribble on the left uh, is George Orwell's rewriting of the opening page of 1984. So you can see um, even the best don't get it right the first time. Headings. Um, this is a rather uh, current uh, case uh, involving the commentator and comedian uh, John Oliver, who's been sued in the United States for allegedly defaming coal companies in West Virginia uh, and a coal boss. Uh, this is the brief, or the submissions, American School and Briefs, the submissions put in by the American Civil Liberties uh, Union. And as you can see, read the contents page and you know where that set of submissions is heading. Uh, and as one of my uh, judicial colleagues said, uh, any um, contents page that says anyone can legally eat shit, Bob, just does invite you to read on. Um, <laughs> now, now, you can see that this is trying to more or less laugh a case out of court, which you would very rarely do. I've never really seen it done. But you can see how the headings work for the author. They're the first go at the submissions. Uh, and so in the more boring case that I gave you at the start, why wouldn't you use headings? Why wouldn't you have a heading, uh, the parties agreed to an April 17 delivery date as a heading? You can put the evidence in underneath if you need to. Um, why wouldn't you have a heading, the widgets were delivered three months late? If, I don't think you'd need to run to a contents page because your submission should come in sure enough that you don't need a contents page. But your headings should be like that, stating what you want the judge to find. Uh, in terms of uh, sequencing, uh, of course, there's a logical sequence for applicants or, or plaintiffs or uh, appellants. Uh, in terms of respondents, you don't need to choose the same sequence that the other party has. Uh, and so if you're uh, writing for a respondent, uh, you might choose to reframe the issue for determination. You might want to join the point of the argument at the point of strength for you. So you might say, even if the applicant uh, is correct in contending X, its claim is flawed because of Y. So you're skipping over X, which might be a sort of finely balanced thing or thing you, you don't have such a strong case about, and going to Y. Y might be a matter of law 
uh, provides complete defense or some complete defense on the facts. So if Y is the respondent's strongest point, you'd put Y first and then return to contest X later uh, if that's open to dispute. So it's just a simple uh, statement of what should be obvious that you lead with your strongest points. Uh, next, uh, engaging with the other side's uh, arguments. Uh, there's no point in resorting to overheated, emotion-laden uh, invective. Uh, apart from anything else, it makes the judge think that he or she's got to find that the other side are cheats and frauds and all the things you're saying they are for you to win the case. Well, why would you set yourself that uh, unnecessary uh, bar? You're making the judge think, I've got to make a character assessment here that these people are contemptuous thieves and rogues. Why would you do that if you didn't have to? It just seems to be quite uh, unnecessary. And I can add, in the presence of the ethics director, completely unprofessional unless it's necessary and you've got the foundation to accuse either a citizen, a corporation or a fellow professional of such serious conduct. So you don't lightly throw off invectives. Um, and in the paper, I've given you uh, examples of how you can uh, coolly demolish someone who has, say, been in breach of court orders more with uh, regret. <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but this is the 18th time that they've done this and they've got to be sanctioned or the defence struck out, rather than saying, these are people are terrible. So that's the way to do it. You've got to engage with the other side's arguments at, at, at some stage. Uh, as uh, President McMurdo said in an earlier speech, uh, of course, get your points into play first, come back to the other side's strengths. You, you wouldn't normally just start in a purely responsive way. Uh, but you can do this pretty early on in oral advocacy or in the writing. Uh, there are three reasons why we should get an injunction to stop whatever. Uh, and the other side's contentions <coughs> lack merit because of this. Uh, and at the bottom of the page there, I give you uh, what might be a more subtle way of doing it. And again, you're not saying uh, the other side's case is fundamentally flawed or it hasn't got a leg to stand on. You know, why would you set yourself such a high bar to prove that? I mean, if it is fundamentally flawed, you can say so. But uh, why would you set yourself that high bar. Why wouldn't you, as a more subtle way of persuasion, say to the judge, well, the point raised by the other side about misleading conduct by silence has a superficial appeal, but it doesn't withstand careful scrutiny for three reasons. Now, what's the message you're giving to the judge? The judge might think, well, I thought it was pretty good. And you're telling the judge in a nice sort of way, that's a piece of superficial thinking. And judge, you're not a superficial person. You're not a superficial thinker. So best to damn the other side's submissions with faint praise rather than unnecessary uh, invective. Judge Kingham, um, at a previous lecture, told you about the different way in which we argue and the different appeals to logic, to the heart, uh, and so on. And I won't build upon what she has to say. Uh, the important thing is uh, the act of persuasion has an emotional element to it. Otherwise, we just have artificial intelligence or Dr. Spock type people as advocates. That doesn't work. Uh, but I think it's rather important that we understand that we're in the 21st century. Uh, and although there are these terrific books about Marshall Hall QC and Sir Patrick Hastings and their terrific oratory in front of juries in the 1930s and, and the like. That sort of advocacy, I don't think, and most people don't think, cuts it these days with juries, and I don't think it cuts it with judges uh, either. That doesn't mean that you have to be emotionless, uh, and the best advocates uh, I've seen, including ones I was juniors to, um, were great advocates because not only were they clear and logical, but they actually sounded like they meant it. <laughs> they sounded like they believed in their client's case, but they were measured uh, in their language. And 
Uh, there's an item written by a senior counsel from Matrix Chambers in London about what he's learned from years in practice, that as judges value advocacy that helps them easily reach their own decision, the client might want to think all the fiery advocacy they've seen on television, you might actually have to explain to the client why it's not a great idea to engage in flowery language when you're, uh, you've got the factory that's polluting the little old lady and making her very sick. Um, so no much point trying to seize the high moral ground. So there's an element of disabusing clients that this isn't going to be some firestorm of uh, advocacy. Uh, and as Mr Ryder says, the most effective advocacy is helpful, clear, brief, thorough, reliable, principled and compelling. Well, who could disagree with that? Which brings me to what the judges uh, want and expect. Well, we love brilliance. If you're brilliant, that's terrific. Um, uh, but we want and expect assistance. Uh, like everyone, we're time poor. Uh, we want written oral submissions that will help us do our job. That's what Mr Ryder says. It's pretty obvious. So what do we want to know? We want to know the essential facts, not extraneous irrelevant facts. We want to know the issue. We want to know that all pretty early. We want a crisp statement of the relevant rule of principle. We don't want 15 cases that all said the same thing. We don't want long quotes that are unnecessary. Um, we want to know what result are you contending for? What sort of injunction do you want? Uh, what are you seeking here? What orders are you seeking here? And we want to know, well, how's the result that you contend for? Plaintiff wins, gets $2.17 million damage. How do I get to that result? And the judge wants to know, well, what have you got to say about the other side's arguments? Uh, as I have said, uh, good written submissions are the raw material for an oral or a written judgment. And that's so in the, in, in the High Court, and it'll be the case for me on Monday when I'm doing a five-minute application for substituted service. So they're the raw material, and they have to have uh, those uh, essential elements. Well, uh, I started by talking about the past uh, but let me move on to uh, modern advocacy. Uh, these are photographs of uh, a court in New York that I was privileged to uh, visit in October 2015. Uh, and it uh, sits above in the hierarchy the Supreme Court of New York. It's a state court. There's a further appeal to the courts of appeal in Albany. But these are heavy hitters. These are the equivalent of our court of appeal or the full federal court. Well, uh, I turned up, and it's a two o'clock start. Pretty good, eh? Um, now, how many cases do they have uh, starting at two o'clock? Well, they actually had 20. Um, some people rested on the written submissions. And these were complicated cases. I mean, really difficult things involving body corporates, people convicted of serious crimes and the like. They're the original estimates of time. You see, the first one thought they are going to go for 10 minutes each, second one, whatever. The presiding judge came in and said, We've added this up, it's going to go for three and a half hours. That's not going to happen. I want revised estimates. And so those little handwritten notes, I'm taking it down. And so away we go. So the people are originally going to be uh, 15 minutes. Council says, four minutes my opening, two in rebuttal. And that's how it went. You know? Five with two. Frightening, isn't it? And those revised times are strictly enforced. There's someone actually gongs you in the middle of the sentence and You've got to stop. Uh, and uh, that's not just, just that court. Uh, I went to uh, a prestigious court of appeal in Washington. I was hearing a case involving incredibly complicated uh, issues, eight big issues for some MS-13 guys who'd been accessory to murder and got under the RICO Act. They were 19-year-olds, and they got um, total sentences of, I think, 120 years. No appeal against sentence, but big, important issues. And the presiding judge says, OK, uh, Mr Campbell, uh, you're arguing that uh, issue, six minutes. And that's how it went. Frightening. Um, imagine that you uh, only had five minutes to present your case and two minutes to rebut uh, the other sides. What essential facts and persuasive points would you present? 
how would you persuasively frame the issue for decision? So prepare your case as if you've only got five minutes to present it. The good news is you're not in those American courts, you're here and we'll probably give you more than five minutes. But what you've done there is prepare your opening. Well, uh, I've uh, overlooked the middle. The middle doesn't write itself. There's need for structure and all the things that I, I've mentioned. It doesn't mean the submissions have to go for 50 pages. Uh, and I've got there the appeal submissions in the Baden Clay Appeal in the High Court. And Mr. Sofnroff brought it in on the word length, a complicated appeal in, in many ways factually and legally. So it can be done uh, concisely. Uh, the last word, the closer. Well, some people in their written submissions just say, conclusion, for the reasons appearing above, the application should be dismissed. Some people just end their oral submissions with a bit of a whimper, uh, and sometimes who can blame them if I've been bashing them up for <laughs> the last 50 minutes? But um, closing is important. Uh, of course, it has to align with your argument. Um, but the closing statement should just be a bit more fresh. It can come at things from a different angle, and it's based upon what's gone before. So uh, it might, in an appropriate case, have a bit more zing to it uh, than the uh, opening. Uh, signs of effort. Uh, that's not by a lawyer, it's by a great uh, American writer. And as he says, writing that appears effortless takes the most work. And when you talk about effortless prose, what you're talking about is something that doesn't require a lot of effort to read. Same with an incredible storyteller. So uh, that is uh, our lot, to be uh, people who try to write uh, effortless prose. Uh, in the paper, I don't have time to tell you too much about this, but uh, there's some criminal lawyers in the audience I, I know, and there's a terrific bestseller called Jeremy Hutchinson's Case Histories. It's about a great UK criminal law barrister. Uh, and uh, I give the example in, from that book. He had to appear for a guy called Vassal, who was uh, an idiot uh, and was charged with spying and was guilty. So uh, Hutchinson had to plead on his behalf for an appropriate sentence. The judge who he was appearing in front of not long earlier had sent another spy to jail for 42 years. And you read Hutchinson's plea to that judge and you think how clever it was, and he was emphasising the greatness of the judicial process against executive uh, orders uh, and the smallness of Vassal, this man in the judge's grip. Uh, and so he gently belittled uh, his client as, as you know, an amateur and, and the like. The point is, I doubt whether Jeremy Hutchinson just stood up in court in front of the Lord Chief Justice and just rolled off the tongue. This beautiful prose must have been prepared. Uh, also in the paper, I talk about the great uh, advocate against the death penalty, uh, Anthony Amsterdam, who uh, appeared in the US Supreme Court uh, in 1967 when he was a very young lawyer and knocked the socks off people. He came back in 1971 and argued the Furman case, and that led in 1972 to the US Supreme Court abolishing the death penalty at that time, and he swayed uh, Byron White, who regarded it as one of the best pieces of oral advocacy he'd seen. Now, um, Amsterdam was just a craftsman with words. He would rewrite other people's briefs for them. He did all his pro bono work, and he taught legal writing, clinical legal education at NYU. He regarded writing legal briefs, when you're trying to save someone from the death penalty, as requiring the same skills as a poet. And he explained to someone whose work he revised, who he said, well, I want to go this. He actually said, well, I want the justices to stop right there and think about it. And the way he wrote it proved to be a winning point and got someone off death row. So that's a pretty good uh, sign of good advocacy. Well, um, I'm going to wrap up in a second. The book that I uh, brought here tonight, some of the younger people won't be aware of what these are. These, these things are called law reports. Um, <laughs> and, and, and you can actually uh, benefit from them because they have the, the arguments. 
that people use. And I remember reading this when I was sitting at Oxford College in 1983, and it was a case called British Steel and Granada Television, where uh, confidential information that British Steel had had been leaked out to Granada Television, to the great embarrassment of British Steel, and British Steel wanted to find out who the source was, and so they sued uh, Granada Television and applied for what's called a Norwich Farmical Order, where you're not suing them for damages, but we want an order, so you tell us who the wrongdoer is so we can go and sue the wrongdoer. And it started off before Sir Robert McGarry went up to the Court of Appeal, Lord Denning and others, went to the House of Lords. And superficially, at least, it's a case about freedom of the press and free flow of information and democracy uh, and all of these things. Uh, but uh, the advocate for uh, British Deal um, was a guy called Lenny Hoffman, um, QC. And uh, read that passage. He starts off in a brilliant way by simply saying, this case is not about the freedom of the press. So it doesn't say, could you turn to page 432 and you'll see the judgment of the Court of Appeal. He then goes through and explains that the issues that this might have given rise to, but they didn't. He said, well, there could have been an intelligible question raised about this or that or the other thing, but that's not the issue here. So he, he says, it doesn't raise this issue. That would have been an interesting issue if they'd raised it, wouldn't it? It would have been interesting, but that's not the issue. And so he goes through the process of reframing it. And then he, he comes in with this terrific summary. He says, in summary, therefore, this issue raises the narrow issue of whether the public interest requires that a plaintiff should be denied redress against the person who has violated his duty of confidence by giving secret information to the media when, and you can read the ABCD. So, you, that's a beautiful reframe. And I imagine, he's brilliant, he probably just dashed it off, but most people would take a bit of time to actually reframe it. So I'd encourage you to read uh, advocates, uh, just like uh, I read uh, judges. Uh, Lord Bingham is one of my heroes. Uh, I wrote an obituary about him. Uh, this is one of the torture cases that uh, came after the 9-11 uh, uh, and people were detained in the UK. Uh, and that's how he opens, opens his judgment, beautifully written. Now, this appeal was about where the onus of proof. Did someone who claimed that the uh, evidence that the authorities were relying upon for executive detention, did they have to prove that that evidence was extracted by torture, or did the British government have to prove that it wasn't obtained by torture? Now, just read every word that he's written there about the test that the Secretary of State proposes. It's just a beautiful piece of writing. It's not legal writing, <laughs> well it is. It's just writing. Uh, and so that's the gold standard uh, to which uh, we uh, aspire. Uh, in the paper, I've got a bibliography, but as I say, how do you find out this stuff? You read really good submissions. You can get them online. You can get Mr. Sofnoff's submissions from the baden clay case. Read, they're available. Uh, read books, there's lots of things uh, on, online. Uh, and so uh, let me conclude uh, with this. If I can leave you with one point, uh, it's this. Uh, your uh, available time should be directed to producing a good opening. The opening few paragraphs of a piece of persuasive writing should distill the essence of the case. Time spent on the opening is well worth it. Uh, the opening may not be the first thing that you write. Uh, if it is the first thing that the carpenter builds in accordance with the architect's plans, then it may need to be rebuilt a number of times before you get it right. Try to write the opening in words that make it easy 
for the reader to understand the basic facts and the issue he or she has to decide. Put the effort in as a writer to ensure that the reader can quickly comprehend what the case is about. And try to frame the issue in a way that means that if the court accepts the question that you framed, the answer will favour your client's case. If the reader, and that's a judge, if the reader accepts the way you frame the issue, the case is half won. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.